Today on Masters of Austrian Economics, it's time to focus on Ludwig von Mises, for my money, the greatest economist of the 20th century. He wrote over 20 books in over 60 years. Of these, about half are collections of lectures, essays and articles. The four most important books by Mises are The Theory of Money and Credit, written in 1912, Socialism, written in 1922, Human Action, which was published in English in 1949, and Theory and History from 1956. If you just get one, however, make sure it's Human Action. It is difficult to narrow down Mises' many contributions to economic theory, but arguably his most lasting and important ideas are, first, his insistence on the praxeological method and his insistence that economics cannot be a positivist science. Second, his critique of economic interventionism and so-called third-way solutions between socialism and the free market. Third, his analysis of the economic calculation problem, which was at the core of his critique of socialism. And finally, his expansion of Austrian economics into monetary theory and his explanation of the role of expansionary credit in boom-bust cycles. Let us take each of these at a time. All through his career, Mises rejected attempts to treat economics as a hard science, like physics, because humans are not like stones, which behave in a predictable way. Since we must decide and act under uncertainty in a constantly changing world, there are no constant variables in human action. Therefore, economics must be deduced logically from a few self-evident truths. In fact, Mises argued that the whole of economics can be derived from just one self-evident truth. Humans act. We engage in purposeful behavior to achieve desired end. This does not need to be empirically tested because it is self-evident. Action aims to achieve a more satisfactory state of affairs from a less satisfactory one. If this were not true, no one would ever act. Think about the simple task of making a sandwich when you feel hungry. If the sandwich was not a move towards a more satisfactory state of affairs from your current situation, why would you make it? Mises implicitly builds on Menger's law of cause and effect and bon Bavirk's recognition that all human action takes place in time. To derive a complete and systematic theory of economics exclusively through chains of deductive reasoning. There are two more subsidiary postulates Mises requires. First, the observation that leisure is a valuable good, that is, humans tend to prefer leisure to labor. Second, that individuals vary. Once these facts are established, everything else can be derived from the action axiom. For example, from the fact that humans engage in purposeful behavior towards desired ends, we can derive the fact that the means employed must be scarce in relation to those ends, because if all means were not scarce but superabundant, the ends would already have been attained, and there would be no need for action. Since action must take place in time, and since humans must act in the belief that this action will make a difference, we can deduce that man does not have omniscient knowledge of the future, for if he had such knowledge, no action would make any difference, and so the future is uncertain. Because of this, we also prefer to attain satisfactions now rather than in some future time and so on and so forth. There is no need to test these claims empirically because they are simply true. The strength of this logical deductive approach is that they create economic laws that cannot be falsified. Here are a few examples. Whenever two people, A and B, engage in voluntary exchange, they must both expect to profit from it. Whenever an exchange is not voluntary but coerced, one party profits at the expense of another. The law of marginal utility. The law of association, that is, the idea that specialization in the division of labor is mutually beneficial. 
whenever minimum wage laws are enforced that require wages to be higher than existing market wages, involuntary unemployment will result. Whenever the quantity of money is increased while the demand for money to be held as cash reserve on hand is unchanged, the purchasing power of money will fall. Now, if anyone wants to debate these, they must do it logically. Empiricism is open to abuse of all kinds. Here is a study showing that there was this town once where jobs were not lost after minimum wages were introduced. Here is a study showing that there have been at least five cafes in which the per millimeter cost of a large coffee was higher than that of a small coffee, and so on. These sorts of arguments are silly, not only because there are no constant variables against which to test these claims, there is no science lab of the real world economy, but also because they are attempting to defy logic itself. These aren't historically or locally contingent things. It's not as if the law of supply and demand stops being true just because you're in California in 2019. It is always true. One consequence of Mises' rigorous logic is his insight that there are only two ways of allocating resources, to trade or to do it by force. The former only trade is capitalism or the free market. The latter only force is pure socialism. Some people argue that there is a middle road between these two. But Mises showed that this simply leads to socialism by increment. He uses the milk industry as one example. We have numerous sellers in the market at different price points. The government decide the price of milk is too high. They want more poor children to have milk. And so decree that the maximum price of milk must now be only two gold pieces. The result is that the marginal producers of milk, those producing at the highest cost, now incur losses. As no individual farmer or businessman can go on producing at a loss, these marginal producers stop producing and selling milk on the market. They will use their cows and their skills for more profitable purposes. They will, for example, produce butter, cheese or meat. There will be less milk available for the consumers, not more. And so to fix the problem it's created in the first place, the government will be moved to pass a second decree and a third decree and a fourth one and so on until the market becomes more and more hampered by rules and regulations until we slide into total socialism. This brings us neatly to his critique of socialism itself. Up until Mises was writing in 1920, the standard critique of socialism from the economics profession had been that it does not properly consider incentives and so will fail on the basis of human nature. Mises, however, came at the problem from a totally different angle. He said that socialism was destined to fail because, in the absence of a price system, central planners would not be able efficiently to allocate the factors of production in complex supply chains. To explain this, first let's consider how this is done under a free market. So at the bottom, we have consumer goods and a set of consumer prices. That's the stuff that you and I buy at the supermarket. But each one of those goods is made of various producer goods that have price points in the chain of production. In order to make a profit, we know that the per unit cost of each of those consumer goods must total less than the final price of the consumer good. These price points emerge on the market in a complex network of exchanges. Let us pick out the producer and seller of an intermediary good, for example, baking soda. This is a resource which has alternative uses. It can be used to make toothpaste or bread or some other good. The baking soda producer knows how to allocate this resource based on the demand from the various producers of the consumer goods. Let's say the baker wants more than the toothpaste maker, so he buys a bigger bulk load at a lower per unit cost. He ends up with more baking soda than the other producers. If we look at his own production process now, he can calculate exactly what his daily costs will be. Planning to sell 150 loaves of bread, he works out a per unit cost of 0.52 gold pieces. He wants to 
make around one gold piece profit on each loaf, so he sets one and a half gold pieces as his price. He ends up selling 138 loaves, so he doesn't make as much as he was planning, but he still makes 129 gold pieces. Not a bad day's business. Let's say in the next week, word of this chap's bread gets around and now demand has increased. He sells out all 150 loaves and actually ends up turning people away. Our baker thinks he can gain from this increased demand and given that he cannot yet afford the 4,000 gold pieces it would take to buy a new oven to increase his production capacity, he raises his price to do two gold pieces per loaf. This booming trade and the new higher price sends a signal to entrepreneurs that there's money to be made here. And soon enough, another baker enters the market and undercuts our first baker to try to get a piece of the action. And should demand grow, soon enough there'd be a third baker until the average cost per loaf starts to fall again as the total demand for bread is met by the new supply. And this takes place across the board, up and down the production chain, across thousands and thousands of products in the economy. Now, imagine doing all of this without any prices. The complex network of exchanges from which these prices emerge is now gone. Instead, it is now up to a commissar to decide exactly how much of each product must be made at every stage of production. In the complete absence of all information, the commissar can only guess. He must have an idea that bread is important and so commands 1,000 units should be made. And from this he could, I suppose, work backwards and work out how many intermediary goods he needs. Remember that on the market, intermediary goods are allocated through a series of bids and exchanges. But when centrally planning, this must be done categorically. Maybe in this case, the commissar decides bread is more important than the other uses of baking soda. Of course, because the commissar has simply guessed the level of demand, this might lead to a severe overproduction or underproduction of goods. He can react to this the next day, but by then it's already too late, since he's already invested in all the capital goods required to make, for example, bread at 1,000 units per day. The equipment and the workers set up for this purpose are simply wasted. However, this was not exactly Mises' argument. His point was much subtler than this. He said, okay, let's grant the commissar superhuman powers of knowledge for the moment. Let's imagine that the commissar somehow knows the exact preference scales of all the consumers in the economy right now. Let's pretend he knows that today the consumers want exactly 138 units of bread and exactly 124 units of toothpaste and so on. Even in this case, the commissar comes up against some severe problems. For example, what if there were fluctuations in demand? We saw that on the free market, entrepreneurs would allocate capital to produce a good with increased demand using the prices of bread and profits of bakers as a signal to get into that market. But what would our commissar do in the same circumstances? He could surely recognize a rise in demand, but now he has to go back through and calculate mind-bogglingly complex set of numbers. How many ovens do they need? How much baking soda is needed? How many farms are needed? How will this affect the supply of baking soda to toothpaste production? How much steel is needed to make the tractors to plough the fields for the farms? All of these numbers need to be adjusted to reflect the new reality. Now I have just outlined a few products here and even then I've massively shortened and simplified the production chain. Now imagining doing this for all of the tens of thousands of goods and production processes in the entire economy and you have some sense of the socialist calculation problem. But that is not all. Even imagining that, somehow they could do all this. The next problem is how to deal with changing technology and changing tastes. We don't live in an evenly rotating economy, that is the economy is not predictable. 
we live in a world of uncertainty and constant change. So when a new technology comes through on the market, producers can assess exactly how efficient that technology will be versus the alternatives. For example, here are three different methods of producing 150 units of bread a day. Which one is the most efficient? The cost per unit price tells us that the super duper oven on the right is better than the less advanced oven in the middle, which in turn is better than using the less capital intensive and more labor intensive method on the left. But take these prices away and how do we know which method is most efficient? Same number of units, same amount of time. So these are all equally efficient, right? The commissar would never know. He also faces a real problem when there's a consumer demand for some new technology. He's just managed to get some semblance of the rest of the economy planned and now this new thing comes along. How many should be made? How many factories should be built? How much steel should we take from elsewhere in the economy to reallocate to this? He has absolutely no way of knowing. Whereas in a market economy, all of these questions are answered by entrepreneurs and capitalists. The key issue then is the question of appraisement. Central planners recognize the function of the manager, but they do not recognize the vital role played by entrepreneurs and capitalists in capital allocation and price formation. Thus, to use Mises' phrase, a truly socialist economy is impossible. At the time, many socialists seized on this word impossible and tried to answer Mises by pointing out that the Soviet Union was up and running and appeared to be functioning, however inefficiently. But Mises pointed out that the USSR was using Western prices as a basis for its system. It sold exports to market economies and they were using consumer prices in its own economy. So it stands to reason that they would just be a very inefficient economy rather than an impossible one. One Soviet economist famously joked that even if communism were to take over the entire world, they'd still leave Hong Kong just to steal its price index. However, in the real world USSR, we saw many examples of what Mises was talking about. Famously, the managers of the nail factories were given a weight quota and so to meet their targets as soon as possible, they simply made bigger nails, which were useless for construction. Similarly, in the late 1950s, there was an epidemic of people being killed by ch chandeliers falling on their heads because the managers of the chandelier factories likewise were making them as heavy as possible to meet a weight quota. Even more tragically, the USSR produced a food shortage in the 1980s by allocating too many workers to manufacture tractors and not enough to transporting diesel or to harvest wheat. They had fields full of unharvested wheat and rusting tractors while people were starving. Even worse, in 1917, after the revolution, Lenin and the Bolsheviks attempted to run Russia without prices of any kind. Things disintegrated very quickly and people reverted essentially to scavenging. They had to break up and burn family heirlooms for firewood. Many people starved. Incidentally, although the calculation problem was first leveled at socialism, Mises later noted that this would in fact be a problem for any monopolistic firm which came to dominate the production factors in a given industry, what he calls vertical concentration. He expands on this in a book from 1944 called Bureaucracy. This is perhaps why Large companies today use internal billing or intercompany recharges. I'm sure many people watching this with experience of working at a very large firm knows how efficient some of those internal processes can be. Let us turn our attention now to another great insight from Mises, the Austrian business cycle theory, outlined first in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit. Karl Menger had explained the origin of money as arising spontaneously from the need for a medium of indirect exchange to solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants. In fact, historically, the barter economy has never actually existed for this reason. 
virtually all known economies had always already developed money. Mises went far beyond Menger, however, in analyzing the various functions of money. Once it is established as a medium of exchange, it can then serve four secondary functions. A store of value, that is money in your pocket or in the bank, means of payment, paying for something today, or means of deferred payment, paying for something in the past or in the future. And finally, to establish concrete prices used for economic calculation. Mises notes that as well as money in the narrow sense, that is commodity money like gold, credit money, essentially IOUs, and fiat money issued by a government. This is what we have today, by the way. Then there are a number of money substitutes, certificates and tokens and the like, which can be fully covered by real money or uncovered. And Mises was particularly concerned with the role of uncovered substitute money, which he called fiduciary media. To cut a long story short, Mises identified credit expansion as being a hidden form of inflation, especially in fiat money systems in which the government treasury uses bank loans as a way of issuing new money. To give you an example of how this works, take the instance of my own wages, which are mostly funded by student loans. The student is issued a loan, which they use to pay their fees to the university, who then pay me my wages at the end of every month. And then I go and spend those wages on goods and services. I buy my goods and services today, but the student doesn't pay that money back for 10 years or so. In fact, in many cases, they don't pay back the money at all. So in effect, my own wages are a mechanism of new money, essentially created out of thin air, entering the real economy. Because I am the first mover with this new money, I get to enjoy its full current value before the effects of inflation start to be noticed by everyone else. In fact, their savings and their real purchasing power have now been reduced because the value of fiat money has fallen. This is known as a Cantillon effect after Richard Cantillon, considered by many to be the father of economics because he predates Adam Smith. The first receivers of the new money are the ones who profit at the expense of everyone else. The reason why Mises recognize this and why many modern economists do not is because they use aggregate measures rather than methodological individualism and therefore miss what is happening under the surface. Crude macroeconomic measures such as GDP or the total money supply cannot capture what is happening on a micro economic level. They also forget about the role of time. Expansionary credit of this sort can, according to Mises, create the intertemporal misallocation of resources. If the interest rate is artificially lower than where it should be, cheap credit can cause entrepreneurs to invest in risky projects that take longer to pay off. Let's take this chap here. He takes a low interest loan and invests it in building this house. But this house is going to take at least 10 years for the entrepreneur to see a return on investment. And it's possible that they will run out of building materials or there will be some change in the economic environment. So there's a chance this investment will never pay off. But the investor feels bullish for whatever reason. He believes he cannot fail. The increase in fiduciary media can induce entrepreneurs to make these sorts of mistakes. It can lure them into investing into projects that will take too long to pay off. And when this starts to happen systematically, right through an industry or even the whole economy, then we have conditions for a boom and bust cycle to occur. Systematic entrepreneurial error on a wide scale. This in fact happened in Ireland, Spain, and right across Europe in the 2008 crisis. One issue here is that the cheap credit has induced entrepreneurs to start too many investment projects. From a macroeconomic point of view, 
there simply are not the resources to complete all of these projects. A higher interest rate would have stopped most of these projects from starting in the first place and it would increase the chances of those ones which were started of actually being completed. As Mises himself put it in a later essay, credit expansion cannot increase the supply of real goods. It merely brings about a rearrangement. It diverts capital investment away from the course prescribed by the state of economic wealth and market conditions. It causes production to pursue paths which it would not follow unless the economy were to acquire an increase in material goods. As a result, the upswing lacks a solid base. It is not real prosperity. It is illusory prosperity. It did not develop from an increase in economic wealth. Rather, it arose because the credit expansion created the illusion of such an increase. Sooner or later, it must become apparent that this economic situation is built on sand. Considering Mises first made these arguments in 1912, he was one of the few economists who could explain the causes of the Wall Street crash in 1929. Although I should note that he does not explain the causes of the Great Depression. This had different causes that I covered in my video, The Truth About Herbert Hoover. But as Mark Thornton has shown in his book, The Skyscraper Curse, the theory also explains the recessions of the 1970s, the Japanese boom and bust of the 1980s, the 2001 dot-com bubble, and the 2008 credit crunch. Mainstream economics during the 20th century might have been dominated first by John Maynard Keynes and then by Milton Friedman, but it was Ludwig von Mises who had the last laugh. And remember, he also correctly predicted the inevitable collapse of socialism while most other economists were trying to make arguments for how it could work. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Stetson F. Lionel, The Ambivalent Onion, Christopher Scholholm, The Crimson Satyr, Chris, Kieran Hayward, Mr. A. M. Swainson, Radical Liberation, The Binary Surfer, Tragic Vision, Bailey and Aurora, Toyotomi Ami, Holy Spatula, Alexander, Froggy, Splice, Buck Hegett Society, Michael Meir, Jay Green River, Michael Tynan, Heronius Napalm V, Vincenzo Rapio, and Edward Dara. <laughs>